We've talked about the planet Uranus, and so the next one, the last major planet left to talk about is Neptune. Before we talk about Neptune, though, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the discovery of Neptune, because this is an interesting topic, uh, is how Neptune was even found. Remember, Uranus was the first planet discovered uh, with the telescope and was discovered sort of accidentally by William Herschel. Well, after Herschel had discovered Uranus, uh, it was monitored for a number of years. And uh, interesting thing was that a graduate student by the name of John Couch Adams was analyzing the orbit of Uranus and noticed it had a slight irregularity to it. Uh, it appeared to speed up and slow down in a particular part of its orbit. <clears throat> well, that led him to suggest that there might have actually been another planet out there whose gravity was tugging on Uranus as it was going around the sun. Now, this is a really a startling discovery because Uranus, by the time that Adams had made his, his calculations, had not completed yet one complete cycle. So this was not a repeated sort of observation. It was just an observation uh, that was, was one time and noticed that something odd was happening. So he, what he does is he calculates where this is going to be. Now, the problem is he's a graduate student that does not have access to telescopes. He's really more a mathematical student rather than a, a uh, uh, observational astronomer. And so he contacts uh, people with telescopes and asks them to start looking. And they're, they don't really respond to him all that well. They say, you know, you're just a graduate student. You don't know what you're talking about. And um, so he writes a letter. He writes a letter to George Airy. Now, Airy is a famous name in astronomy, something called the Airy disk, which, which is a uh, measure of basically how big something looks in the sky due to atmospheric distortions. You know, when you look at the star, you know, it's, it's a pinpoint because it's so far away, but it really, the light spread out over a disk that we call the Airy disk. And, and it's named after this fellow right here. And he was the... Um, director of the Royal Observatory at the time and a uh, premier facility there in, in England. And so um, he gets this letter and really dismisses it. Uh, and uh, as he dismisses the letter, then Adams continues to try to contact him, try to figure out how, how do I get you know my discovery uh, uh, made. And so what he does is uh, eventually shows up to a reception that Ari is hosting and sort of crashes the party and says, look, here's my calculations. And he sits down with Ari and Ari realizes, well, he's not an idiot. He, he you know, does seem to have done these calculations. So maybe what he ought to do is uh, go ahead and let, you know, let a search happen. So what he does is he passes it on to another fella, um, William Dawes. Dawes is, uh, works at the observatory and actually does some of the observing there. And Dawes, again, the Dawes limit, which is the closest that two things can be to be resolved, a famous name in astronomy. So William Dawes decides that he doesn't really want to spend any time at the observatory doing this. They only have so many telescopes. And um, rather than using one of the telescopes there and not getting other work done, he writes a letter to William Lassell. Now, Lassell is actually an amateur astronomer, but he's a very uh, well-equipped uh, amateur astronomer who has a telescope of his own that's as big as the telescopes there at the observatory. And so what he does is he writes a letter explaining where to look. Now, uh, Dawes, or rather Lassell gets this letter, uh, reads it, says this would be interesting. Then it's cloudy for several days, so he does not go out and start looking. And then he gets the influenza. Now, influenza, particularly in those days, was extremely severe, and it killed a lot of people. Uh, and so he did not die, but he was basically uh, in, in serious trouble. It developed into pneumonia. He very nearly died. Um, and so he was kind of in you know, a sick bed for almost a month. Uh, during this time, his housekeeper comes along and sees that he's already read the letter and throws it away. So 
Uh, eventually, Adam starts pressuring Ares, saying, well, I've, I've, you said you were going to look. Did you look? Ares asks Dawes, well, did, did you look? And Dawes uh, contacts Lasso, who's somewhat embarrassed that he lost the letter to uh, say where to look. So he just simply says he hadn't found anything. And, um, and so uh, uh, Dawes thinks that meant that Lasso looked and didn't find anything. And so he reports back to Airy, well, we did an exhaustive search. There's nothing there. And uh, Airy then tells uh, Adams, well, you really don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing out there. Uh, we looked and looked and looked and couldn't find anything. Completely independently of all this, um, a few years later, not even knowing what Adams had done, uh, not even knowing those calculations, uh, French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier was uh, working on orbits. Now, Le Verrier is really famous in mathematics for some of his orbital calculations and a variety of other things that he's done. And so Le Verrier, uh, in, in terms of, of his calculations, was studying the orbits of the planets and noticed a slight peculiarity in the orbit of Uranus. And so he comes to the exact same conclusion that Adams did. He says, well, I think that there's, there's this uh, extra planet out there. So he calculates where he thinks that planet is going to be. And so he... Uh, uh, you know, again, writes to Airy. Okay, so Airy gets a second letter, and uh, when he gets the letter, he says, oh my gosh, now we have a famous guy saying the same thing. Maybe there really is something really serious here. And so what he does is he, he uh, um, gives it to another assistant, James Challis. Now, Challis is really famous for a lot of great discoveries in astronomy as well. And so, uh, 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 so we have big names in this whole search here. So Chalice decides to search, and he, his way of searching is a little bit peculiar. Rather than looking where uh, he thinks that the, uh, um, uh, where, where Leveria said the planet is, what he does is he decides to map that entire region of the sky and then come back a year later and map that entire region of the sky and see what moved. And so Airy thinks this is really an awkward way of doing it. And he said, why don't you go look in the, in the right spot and just go higher magnification to see if you see something round like a planet. And, uh, but, but Chalice is pretty insistent on how he's going to do this. Now, Le Verrier, on the other hand, doesn't like that idea. Now, he had just recently gotten a word of a fellow named Johann Gall, who had just gotten his PhD. Now, in those days, when you got your PhD, you'd send copies of your dissertation to experts in the field so they are aware, hey, there's a new guy on the block that, that, that's a that's, uh, new professional. And so he had just sent his copy of his dissertation to Le Verrier. Le Verrier said, well, I'm going to contact this Gaul fella, and since he's brand new in his career, maybe he'd be interested in helping. So he writes to Gaul and says, you know, I, I've just made these calculations. There's a planet located at this spot. And so uh, the Royal Observatory wasn't being very helpful, so maybe the Berlin Observatory can do this. So Gaul contacts the director of the observatory, fellow by Johann Inke. Now, Inke is also famous. Uh, there's also an Inke gap in the A-ring of the Saturn, discovered by Johann Inke. Uh, so the A-ring actually, you, we, we, the Cassini division is famous, but there's actually a gap in the middle of the A-ring that, that uh, medium-sized amateur telescopes can find, and Johann Inke discovered that. There's also Inke's Comet and a variety of other um, really great discoveries that he's made. So he contacts Inky, and uh, uh, um, uh, at least Gall contacts Inky. Inky is the director of the observatory, and he doesn't really want to waste time doing this because they're actually busy at the observatory doing a variety of other things. So uh, Gall then decides to get the assistant director of the observatory, Heinrich Durest, uh, involved. And Durest here... Uh, um, thinks this is actually a worthwhile project. So it goes back to Inky and says, look, Inky, uh, 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 we don't really have 
uh, a lot we can do until it gets really dark. So from sunset, you get twilight. After twilight, there's something called, um, after civil twilight, there's something called nautical twilight. After nautical twilight, is astronomical twilight. So when the sun sets, you know, in the city, you think of it getting kind of dark pretty quick. But for astronomers, you notice the sky doesn't really get dark for a very long time. And so he says, during this period of time, you know, it's going to take about an hour after sunset until it gets really dark, you know. So after about 30 minutes or so, you start seeing stars, and then it gets really dark, you know, about an hour later, and then sometimes up to an hour and a half later until we start doing super serious astronomy. Why don't we just use the telescopes, open them up early, and while they're normally just getting used to the temperature, we can start to work with them. So Enki thinks, yeah, that's actually a good idea. So he decides to go along with that idea. And so what happens is that they decide to plan a search for this planet. Well, amazingly, they discovered the planet within the first 30 minutes of observations on the first night, exactly where Le Verrier said it was, which was in the same general area as where Adams had suggested it was a number of years earlier. And so uh, uh, that, that raises questions, you know, who gets credit for the discovery? Um, Adams thought he should get credit for it, but when he reads about this in the newspaper saying that, that uh, German astronomers discover a planet based on French uh, mathematicians' calculations, he finds out that this, this location was pretty darn close to where he said it ought to be, and so he thought he ought to get credit for it. And of course, as often happens, this ended up with a legal challenge and so forth. Most textbooks credit Le Verrier and, and um, Gaul with the discovery. Some of them, some of them credit Gaul and Durest. Uh, um, some just credit Gaul. A few give mention to Adams and his work as well. And so I, I figured just for the sake of, of fairness uh, for our class, I would go ahead and give Adams credit for being participant in this whole project. So this, this is the idea of how this plant was discovered. And um, now it's, it's interesting to note that uh, this was a discovery made by mathematicians that was confirmed by observational astronomers. So it was the first discovery of that sort. As an interesting footnote, about 400 and something years ago, it turns out that Jupiter and Uranus were so, or Jupiter and Neptune rather, were so close together that they were visible in the same field of view as uh, of a telescope. And this was during the time of Galileo. So about 400 years ago, these two planets were so close together that they were, they were visible uh, in the same field of view. And this was a spectacular sort of thing. Uh, uh, um, now, Galileo, uh, on a couple nights here in 1612 and 1613, uh, discovered that there was an extra moon around Jupiter. Now, that extra moon was not discovered again. A lot of astronomers had for many, many years considered that he just made a mistake in his calculation and his observations. But uh, Frank Drake and Charles Cowell calculated uh, a few decades ago that Neptune was directly behind um, Jupiter on those nights and that he might have actually been seeing Neptune instead. Now, he didn't realize what he found. Otherwise, he would have gotten credit for discovery of Neptune. 